Welcome back, everyone. My name is Marie Bakari. I have a DBA in business management and an EDD in higher education and leadership. I'm here today with my colleague, Dr. Brian Allen. Brian, would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, sure. My name is Scruffy and I'm the janitor. No, uh, my name is Brian Allen and I have a DBA, a Doctor of Business Administration. Uh, we are both faculty at National University and we are pleased to be here with you today. Oh, thank you so much. All right. So, um, Dr. Brian, would you take us through the concepts of the problem with fallacy? Oh, Will I ever, because this is one of my favorite subjects. So let me start with um, this premise. So what is a logical fallacy? And a logical fallacy is, a, it's a deceptive or, or a, an incorrect argument that seems stronger than it really is um, based on, quite frankly, psychological uh, persuasion. Um, however, these kind of fallacies, these False arguments uh, typically can be proven wrong with uh, some further reasoning, some further application of logic and, and examination. Um, the mis these mistakes in reasoning, um, say this in a nice way, uh, they consist in an argument uh, and a premise that is not supported or does not support the, the conclusion. And there are all sorts of different, different logical um, fallacies. And one of my favorite um, <laughs> one of my favorite is um, is the classic one. Well, that that makes sense, doesn't it? Right, because because I see this, I have this anecdotal um, condition. This this affects me, and because it affects me, therefore it must be a problem worldwide, nationwide, statewide, whatever the case may be. It may just be in my career. And because I see this problem, therefore it is a problem. There's a there's a, a a false narrative. What if I'm the problem, right? And and can I make a, a study, a doctoral study on myself? I suppose I could. Nobody's going to be interested in it. But um, if I can make a strong enough argument, I suppose I could. So let's talk about some some challenges to that, right? So um, one of the ways that I like to, to start this off is I like to say to each of my students, you need to find at least three articles or more that are from different perspectives that identify a problem as existing, right? So then it can't just be, well, I claim that this is true because I see it. Therefore, my narrative means that this exists and it needs to be solved. And we see this from lots of perspectives. And I'm not calling out any group, any person, any party. So let me be very clear here. It could be relative to your gender identification. It could be relative to your ethnic background, your um, your language um could be relative to your accent, right? Maybe you, maybe you're a first generation American, and your accent is not typical American accent. And you think, well, guess what? There are certain biases that people deal in business with me, and therefore that must be the problem, right? And so I need to solve this problem. And so you create a narrative around that, quite frankly, fallacious logic. And so you want, when you're thinking about um, the terms of identifying a problem, it needs to be founded in research from divergent perspectives, okay? Like my thumb, it came up there. It's, it's giving me the encouragement, right? So is it founded in, in well understood and well respected resource material, peer reviewed sources? Is, are there multiple authors that have identified that problem on, oh, and have they done so in the last three to five years? Because something that may be 10 or 15 years old, it may have been a problem 10 or 15 years ago, but it may not be a problem today. Now, 
I'm not saying that there can't be problems that you identify that that society as a large says, oh, we've solved that problem. But you're going to have you have the burden of proof when it comes to creating an argument. Right. And I don't mean argue with me. I mean, a, 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 an academic argument. Right. A problem that you identify. And so you need to start um, first and foremost with that. Now, one of the things that I'm going to tell you is I'm going to encourage you to check a couple things. Um, uh, check facts. Check the value of those facts. Who's saying what means what, right? So there are lots of narratives out there that I can go and and I can say, bald men are really treated poorly because this is what I have experienced. And my two friends that are bald like me have experienced that same thing. Therefore, I've got three sources and we say bald men are held down. Well, I don't know. I don't think the rocks feel in that way. So, right. So you, you need to think about the, the terms of the foundation for your problem, right? So think about how you create the narrative, make sure that it's factually and scientifically and sound based on peer reviewed sources and don't create straw men that are connecting false narratives and saying A is equal to B and because A is equal to B, therefore C must be a problem. That may actually be completely false. So make sure you are very clear that you found your research. In other words, you create a foundation for that that problem and identification of that problem with peer-reviewed sources. Now, I'm going to give one caveat. This is my own personal one, and I want you to think about it. You will always need to go to your chair if you go this route. And that is, there may be problems that are cutting-edge problems. They only happen because it's a new and narrative technology, and I'm dealing with that. It could be in in healthcare, it could be in tech, in information systems, it could be new and um, challenging issues with um, in the accounting world with, uh, let's say, non tangible uh, tokens, whatever the case may be, right? And it's cutting edge research. Even if you're talking about cutting edge problems, they're always based on existing foundational studies and you can always create a foundation with peer-reviewed sources so in those particular cases work with your chair work with your subject matter expert and say i identify this as a problem here's my narrative for that problem here's the market sources market research relative to that but here's the foundational things that are peer-reviewed to connect those and identify those so that would be the only context again at the end of the day Go talk to your chair. Don't assume that you know, oh, because I identify it, therefore it must be a problem. Make sure you talk with your chair because they will give you sound advice. Marie, what would you add to that? Um, you talked about sources. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize is the quality of those sources. It is imperative when you are doing research that you build on the shoulders of other researchers. What I mean by that is, when we talk about those foundational issues and those foundational pieces that help to um, form the basis of your problem, you're gonna find articles in uh, peer reviewed journals written by scholars that will help to support your problem. Here's where a lot of people make a mistake though. They find one source that they agree with and they wanna run with it. The challenge there is, though, if there's only one source on something, how strong an argument can you make? Now, if you have that source plus a few others, even if they're taking different angles to look at the same issue, you have a much stronger foundation um, if you have a stool with three legs versus, you know, trying to balance on a ball here. So... When we talk about quality sources, make sure you're using the top quality sources. If you're not sure, you have a library that is staffed by librarians who know this stuff. Get in touch with those experts so that you can find the pieces of information you need to 
uh, create that and develop that solid problem for your research. Ryan, I'm going to move on here. And let's talk about narrowing the focus. Of, oh, of let's, do. <laughs> let's do. Let's um, do. Take it away. So, so one of the things that I want to start this idea of narrowing the research, and it really care, continues from our from our previous slide and our previous topic, it is um, cherry picking your resources. It is one of the biggest dangers that if you go into research with a passionate versus an objective, right? So you go into passionate subjective research foundations, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna solve this world problem. I'm gonna solve this problem. And you only look at sources that agree with your narrative or come from your perspective and you don't have a balanced holistic approach to narrowing the problem, you can narrow the focus of your research and be completely wrong. So one of the things that we want to, to, to talk about is this idea of um, knowing where your data is collected from, um, avoiding this idea of cherry picking your sources. Well, I'm only gonna look from this journal and I'm only gonna look for this type of uh, author, right? Cause you're gonna look, you may look for characteristics. And I have seen things where, um, where students will say, well, I only want to look for authors that have a name that is similar to mine because those authors are the only ones who are going to know how I really understand this problem. But, that's the, but therein is the issue. That becomes so narrow and so micro-focused that you're not actually solving any problems. In fact, you may actually exacerbate problems because it becomes so narrow that you create a, a new narrative that some future scholar is, may look at and go, oh, well, that is clearly factual. You do not want to be the source of that errant information. Now, let me just tell you, first and foremost, I have a, a, a friend who takes great pleasure in finding um, issues with previous research. And he uh, he goes out and, and responds to the journals where and to the universities where this errant research has been done. Now, in most cases, he looks at the statistical analysis and the foundation for a study, but he identifies those problems and he writes a narrative about it, writes a blog about it, and he reaches out to those universities, he reaches out to those journals, and he says, hey, there needs to be either a retraction, a modification, a change, or even pull this article article because the side the the the, re, the analysis was errant. You do not want to be the, the party that is um, <laughs> the subject of one of his reviews. They're pretty scathing. So um, think about that in the terms of your of your research. So you want to narrow the focus. And you want to think about that. Now, the thing that I want to get to that I think is probably the best advice I got early on in, um, in my uh, narrowing of my focus is I had, uh, I had a great chair and he has since passed, but phenomenal, phenomenal human being. Um, and I told him what I wanted to study and he said, nope, that's stupid. <laughs> and he wasn't trying to say I was stupid. He was just saying that idea was wasn't a good one. And his point was that even though I had narrowed this idea for my research, I had created something that one had two problems. I couldn't answer the principal question. We'll get to that in a minute. But the secondary question is, how was I going to collect the data that I wanted, right? I had a great focus and I knew exactly what I wanted to do. But if I couldn't collect the data, it didn't matter. But the more important question is, I identified a problem. It was an understood problem. It was a great area of inquiry in my own estimation. I still think it might've been interesting, but it wasn't a great doctoral topic, right? It wasn't great doctoral research. And the question that was asked by the, by the chair of our program when I started my DBA is he said, you can find the problem, but at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, who cares? Who cares if you solve this problem? And if you cannot identify who will be affected 
by the answers that you might potentially find or resolutions you might find, then it doesn't really matter because it's not ideal research. Because we as doctors have to be problem solvers. We need to look at real world problems and find ways to solve those real world problems. So narrowing the focus, thinking about um, who cares, what the end result of that research is gonna be is critical. Now, the very last thing that I wanna talk about here before I turn this over to you, Dr. Bakari, is this. A lack of research does not constitute in itself a need for research. So if you go out there and you say, no one is studying this idea and I'm gonna be, it's gonna be avant-garde, it's gonna be amazing and I'm gonna do this research that's so cutting edge because no one has solved this, there may very well be a reason. One, it might not actually be a problem. Or two, the, the bridge to connect from what is existing and known problems may not exist to get here. And y- your research may need to be that bridge. But just because there's a lack of a re- research does not constitute the need for research in a particular area and focus. So as you're narrowing the focus, think about that. Uh, Marie, I'll hush for a few because I've talked a lot. What would you add to that? Well, let's uh, let's go back to the, the premise of your research. Um, we, you talked a little bit about passion earlier. And one thing I want to um, help folks understand is that passion can lead to bias. Passion can cloud your vision so you don't see what the reality is. You see what you think it is. So while we do want you to bring some passion to your work as a, as a researcher, as a novice researcher, you can't let that passion for the topic get in the way of um, what we actually know, for example. You don't want to reject certain views when you look at the literature just because, oh, well, that doesn't fit my narrative, so I'm not going to use it. In fact, one of the key things, and we're going to talk about literature review strategy a little bit later on, but one of the key things about um, developing a problem to be researched is that you have to be open to whatever is out there in the literature so that the problem that you identify is one, actually researchable, but two, that it has that foundation that we've been talking about. So yes, passion is necessary. Passion should be a personal driver, but passion should not get in the way of you seeing what the reality is relative to the problem that you're investigating. So have that passion, yeah, but make sure that you channel it um, to help yourself and not let it get in the way. So I want to uh, move forward with um, time management. When we, you have a limited amount of time to get your doctorate. Uh, When you entered the program, you had a timeline in your head or a plan for your life. Um, And that you have to execute that plan with a vision in mind, right? And you have certain goals that you have to achieve um, in order to be able to be successful. So let, let's start here. You have to set priorities because your um, seeking that doctorate is not happening in a bubble. It is happening in view of your life in general, your family, your work life, um, the things that you would enjoy doing. Um, And in light of everything else that's happening in the world that touches you. So as you approach your doctoral studies, you need to have a plan. You need to have a plan that is going to work with your life Um, with your work life, family, um, any new family members that might come along, marriages, people passing away. All of these things will have an effect on on your timeline. But if you don't set those priorities, 
all of those things happening are going to overwhelm you and they can overtake this process easily because you you may you may uh, put the, the dissertation or the doctoral study at a lower priority and it just keeps dropping to the bottom of the list. So uh, be purposeful about setting those priorities, but be realistic about it. Um, we talk often in uh, doc to doctoral students about journaling. This is one of my favorite parts of the process, actually. Um, we don't. I I find that uh, over time we re we rely on electronics and um, little notes that we can store in our phones. But if we have a book that we can make our little notes in, our handwritten notes, um, it helps to commit some of those th thoughts uh, to memory. Um, but it's also a place where we can reflect back on what it is that we're doing. Consider journalizing when you are going through this process. If your journal is with you every day and you're talking to people about this fantastic research project that you're doing, you know, from time to time, they're going to pose a question to you that you may not have the answer to. But if you write that question down and then when you get back to your studies, you can reflect on that. Oftentimes we surprise ourselves at the discoveries we make just because of that little note. So consider journaling. Let's, uh, let's move on to um, organizing ourselves. Uh, we keep calendars. We put uh, reminders in our phone. We set alarms. Set aside some time specifically every day to work on your dissertation. During that time, it doesn't have to be all writing. You could be finding new articles. You could be reviewing feedback that you've received on a previous iteration of your work. There are any number of tasks that you could be doing during that time. But the fact that you've set that time aside is um, it's going to be a driver for you to keep on working. If you set aside the same time every day, you everyone has a different lifestyle. So for me, that time is first thing in the morning when I wake up and nobody else is awake, that is a time that I can set aside to work on the tasks that are meaningful to me. So if I'm working on a dissertation or an article and I have that time set aside, well, then I can devote my energies and my energy is always high in the morning, but I can devote my energies to, um, to doing that work. When I'm done, my time's up. It's like, oh, Got to set it aside. Got other priorities that I need to take care of. By all means, I can focus on those other priorities and I can still uh, get the work done, right? I can be proud of the work that I accomplished that morning as I go through the day. But at the same time, I'm reflecting on the work that I've done and I'm planning forward in my head. Oh, well, I can do that tomorrow. The next time I sit down, I can get back to task and I can put this all together. So lastly, chart a path for progress. And this can come in many different forms. I like storyboards. I like dream boards. I like mind maps. I like calendars. Um, when, you, when you enter the dissertation process, there's going to be some sort of map that you can follow, uh, things that you should know to expect and you can use within that uh, that map, you can set timelines for yourself. It's like, oh, I want to be finished by this, by this time. Oh, I have so many weeks to accomplish this. How am I going to get there? And you can plot a path forward so that by the time you get to that, uh, that mark in the sand that you set for yourself, you can say, oh, yes, I achieved that. And know that there are going to be setbacks. But if you go into it with a plan, um, you're going to come out on the other end a lot better than if you just, oh, yeah, I'll get back and do that next week. Um, let me think about that. For, that kind of procrastination actually will hurt the process. So if you have, if you go, if you've come into this and you know, oh, I want to be done in three years then you need to set out a plan, a purposeful plan 
to meet that timeline, knowing that there are going to be holdups, but also knowing that there are times when you're actually going to be able to work ahead. So plan, plan, and more planning, but pay attention to your time and don't, don't think that you have to sacrifice everything in your life to achieve this. But if you go into it with clear ideas about what you're going to do and when, if you stay organized, and more importantly, if you share that plan with the people that matter, like your committee members, um, your family, your close family members, um, your supporters, your mentors, share that plan because they can help to keep you on, on the path to success as well. Brian, anything to add there? You know, the thing that I think is most important here um, is uh, in time management is really to think about this. There's something you can do every day. It does not have to be the same thing. It doesn't even have to be the same time every day, but you do have to dedicate some time every day. But do you do have to step away. And so for me, I worked on I worked on my on my dissertation. I worked on my coursework, et cetera, every day except for Sunday. And I did not work on Sundays. I took that day for a family day for religious reasons, and um, that was that was my time to recharge. And what happened is I could get up early on a Monday morning, and I could go back at it, and I went uh, I could look at things with a clear eye and a mindset. Now, one of the ways that I did this, and certainly. Everybody is different, but what this is what I did. I dedicated at least two hours every day. One hour was to reading and one hour was to writing. And then I would take my lunch break and I would eat my lunch uh, super fast, um, usually like five, 10 minutes. And then um, that probably is not great for the digestion, but nonetheless, that's how fast I ate. And then I would spend the rest of my lunch hour editing for what I had written the night before, because I, I, that was all I was doing was the editing and going through and saying, well, that doesn't make any sense. I need to move this sentence here and that, that there. So setting priorities, the organizing, charting your path for the success are all, are all fine and dandy. But at the end of the day, if you don't work, you can have great plan, plan projections of what you think you're going to do. But if you don't, work your time management is for not you have to put forth the effort and that's the most critical part of the time management in this is apply some serious effort and time if you know you have a weakness in writing get with a writing center if you know you have a, a need for help with um, your statistics or whatever the case may be in this process uh, methodological instruction your university will have support structures for those things. That needs to be allocated in your time management. And you need to think about how you're going to use those priorities, that organization with those particular resources to help you be successful. That's where I think time management has to be best used. So I'll turn it back to you, Marie. Well, thanks uh, for adding those thoughts. Very, very important. I'm going to uh, dig into uh, what I said I would of the literature review strategy. Let's talk about what the literature review is first. Um, the literature review essentially is that you have found as much information as you can, as much scholarly information as you can around the topic that is the focus of your dissertation. And this thing can take many, many different shapes. Um, it can be organized in different ways. First thing is you're going to follow what your university sets out. But here's an example. One of the things that I, I had fun doing with my literature review, and yes, I did have some fun with it. Um, I found all of this wonderful material. And then I actually decided to organize it in two different ways. The first way was if part of it was organized as a historical review of um, the circumstance. I was studying um, small business development, I was studying micro enterprises, and I was studying a particular um, demographic. So there was a lot of literature that was out there on this particular demographic and micro, uh, micro organizations. So I compiled that as an historical review. But then there was 
another part of my literature review that focused on the current state of micro businesses in the United States. And this is back in 2014, yes, ages ago. But the, the literature around um, the business environment um, was very much different from looking at things from an historical perspective. So I had two different ways of organizing that material within the literature review. And of course, it's not perfect for every single topic. But what I do want to open your minds to is that as you're developing this literature review, there are different ways to organize it. Work with your chairs um, and your committee members to figure out the best way. So um, let's start at the beginning here. One of the things you have to do is really find good, solid literature, okay? And how do you do that? Um, you, you have to use the resources that are available to you through your university. Contact a librarian. Have the librarian help you find sources that support your topic, that, um, that help you discuss the framework that you're using or the methodology that you're using for your, uh, for your research. But the first uh, bullet here talks about honesty and integrity is required. Yeah, uh, this has a lot to do with how you choose your sources. Because again, we've talked a little bit um, off and on about the quality of sources. Be sure that you're using the very best. Because the, the research that you build today, and no lie, it's going to follow you through life, right? Your, your future students, your future employers. This will be a public document with your name on it, and they may want to delve in to see, oh, what kind of researcher is this person? If you, if you go into this process with honesty and integrity first, um, you will produce a literature review that you can stand on, that you don't mind following you um, throughout life. Now, <clears throat> We have to use uh, some logic when we're uh, approaching the literature review. I mentioned mind maps. One of the key tools that I have my students use is a mind map. I have them put their problem and the purpose of their research right in the middle. And then I start, I tell them, think about your problem. What discussions do you think are relevant? By putting it all down on paper, they can explore each area and they can find whatever there is to find on each area. And they go through and uh, as they go through each topic, they write up that topic. Now, I haven't talked about organization yet, but what I am saying, be open to that exploration. And if you have a mind map, follow your mind map. If, for example, with many... Um, business models, for example, or many education models, um, the models are preset. So you can actually use the model to follow the literature where it leads. Um, and it's a logical, um, a logical plan to your literature review. Don't go into and say, oh, I'm just looking for things on this topic related to this topic. You can't be so specific that because if you're too specific, you eliminate a lot and you will weed out a lot of very valuable articles. So work with that librarian so that you can find the sources that you need. Uh, Dr. Ellen earlier talked about cherry picking. Yeah, you don't want to do that in the literature review. The literature review should be robust. It should be honest. Um, and you want to put forward as many ideas as are available on your topic of interest. The reason for that is you don't know what your results are going to be. And when you get your results, you need to have something to reflect back upon so that you can make meaning of those results. So it is so worthwhile to explore the literature. We talk about an exhaustive literature review. That doesn't mean it has to be long. It does mean though, that you are going to see what is out there and you are going to bring all of these 
wonderful scholarly ideas, principles, theories, and thoughts together to tell the story of your problem. So let's, uh, let's go into this just a little bit more. Boolean operators. This is a, um, a named term for how you search for literature in a database. We can use a variety of databases. There's always, um, every university has a library. Um, within the library, there are several databases that are pooled together based on the um, direction and uh, specializations that the university offers. But if you learn to use the Boolean operators, what that does is it helps to tailor your searches so that you get the articles that are really relevant to what it is that you're studying. Um, and these are word, simple words like and, or, um, not. Um, you can search by journals, okay, in your library. You can, if, if you're studying business, there are tons of business journals that you can actually look into to find information on your topic. If you're studying psychology, there's all sorts of psych, um, psychology journals. So you can search through journals, you can search the databases, um, but either way, these knowing and understanding how these Boolean operators work um, can make the difference between you wading through thousands of articles or looking through a handful to find the information that you're looking for. Um, here's a here's a little uh, map of how these operators work, and these work by logic. Um, if you've ever taken a course in logic, it's a, a branch of mathematics. You can see how the logical arguments here of and or or not actually can help um, help fine tune your searches as you look for those uh, for the literature. So I mentioned the uh, different. Um, databases and you know using university libraries but that's not the only place to start especially if if this is a topic that you you think you know some stuff about but you want to explore it a little bit more in everyday language um google wikipedia these are great starting points there are great ways to develop some ideas or great ways to expand your thinking now the first uh, first thing we talked about was honesty and integrity. And of course, Google, um, they're, they're just searching what's on the web. And Wikipedia is a, um, is a forum where anybody can go in and edit the content. So when we're talking about reliable sources, yeah, not so much with Google and Wikipedia, but when it comes to general understanding, wrapping your head around different ideas, it's a great place to start. You'll find vocabulary that's relative to your topic. You will find concepts that you're not sure where they came from, but you may actually find some threads to follow on various concepts. So I always say use these as a starting point, but with that warning that you have to move from beyond Google Scholar and Wikipedia onto those more reliable sources that we'll find in academic databases. Okay, so um, let's talk about writing for just a couple of seconds. Um, you've made it this far in your uh, education journey um, in great part by writing. However, you have to be open to transforming your writing as you go through the dissertation process. It is a different style of writing. It is a different type of writing. It is not the same way that you, it's not the language that a newscaster would use um, if you were watching the news. And they they speak intelligently for the most part, but it is, it's uh, the sentences are not formed the same way. Um, there are certain things that are not permitted in um, or frowned upon in academic writing, such as my favorite, anthropomorphism, you know, animating inanimate objects or attributing human characteristics to things. As you go through the process of gathering information and putting it on paper, don't be afraid to get a writing coach. 
to help you correct things as you go along. In fact, you can uh, start your growth as a writer from the day you enter your doctoral program. Um, you have to know what the requirements are. You have to practice those requirements. And what better place to practice than as you're going through courses and writing assignments or creating presentations. Learn the, sk the skill of following a particular um, publication format. There's MLA, there's APA. APA is commonly used in business schools because the language of APA is very similar to the language we use in, uh, to communicate in business. But be prepared to grow as a writer. Be prepared to invest the time to develop your skills as a writer and as an editor. And we'll talk about um, self-editing uh, later down the road, but be prepared and be open to that growth. And you will notice that even in your day-to-day -day lives, as you grow as a writer, as a scholarly writer, that your communications with others will improve over time. You'll notice that your business communications, those things, those ways that you communicate while you are at work, those will change. And that's a good thing um, because, you know, in managers, manager positions, supervisor positions, fact is we want to communicate in a way that gets things done. As you grow as a writer, you will find that that changes as well. And Dr. Allen, I've talked a lot about this. So uh, what are your thoughts? What do you want to add here? Oh, I think we've got another 20 minutes and we could talk about this. No, actually, let me talk about the, um, I, I think maybe the great closures to this. Um, let's talk about journals and the selection of journals. Um, there's a big difference between a tier three journal and a tier one journal. And as if you look at the source material that you are going to cite, um, you need to be mindful of the type of journal that you are going to cite and the type of, um, well, the type of credibility you're going to give to that particular journal. So be very careful when you are uh, citing a journal that you are not getting a journal that's quite frankly a pay for a publish journal. Those can be very nefarious um, and there are a fair number of those out there that are, I would call, um, I don't even think I'd call them tier three journals, right? They're just, they're way down on the, on the, on the, the, the broad spectrum of capacities to give you fair and uh, uh, objective assessment of, of the problems that may exist. So be very careful in, in what you select. Um, if ever in question, use your librarians and your library to help you identify um, the value of a particular journal. If it seems to be good, too good to be true, if you're looking at the at the source and and every narrative is exactly the way you want it to be, mm, apply some healthy skepticism. I'm just going to tell you that very rarely do two human beings ever agree. Um, in everything. We might agree, you know, with our partner, with our significant other, and in a lot of things, but we also have differences. The, and different, different perspectives are healthy, and they're part of good narratives that help us analyze problems as they may exist. So the way you see something may be very different from somebody else, may, or maybe in close proximity, but if you're exactly the same, mm, that may be it could be a political narrative. It could be a social narrative that, quite frankly, can weaken your argument. And you want to be able to stand on a strong foundation with your lit re review for your study. Now, the only other thing that I would talk about in a lit review strategy is to think about the organization of your lit review when you write it. And so what I often tell my students is organize in the following manner. Organize oldest to newest, biggest to littlest, and widest topically to narrowest topically. And if you think about organizing in that way, when you are actually reading the literature, you're classifying your literature that you've read and you're organizing it in that process. So you do these Boolean searches, keep track of where you have success in your Boolean searches in particular terms. I, again, I would agree, agree with Marie here. This 100%, I have no problem with students using Google or Wikipedia or any other source out there to understand what terms to use in a proper academic library. 
do not go about citing Wikipedia as an expert. Be be always suspicious of any of the source material you uh, cited in Wikipedia. Remember that's selective. It's selected for a narrative for whoever the the author at will chose to cite. And always in your strategy for your literature review, try to find the seminal works that are foundational for the rest of your research. That's why you kind of got that, that oldest to newest approach. If you do that and you use those seminal works, don't just because it agrees with you, don't call that a seminal work. Um, you really need to be seminal. And if you don't know, ask your chair, work with the library. In other words, don't assume you know because the narrative fits your narrative. And that's what I would add to it. I don't know that there's much more that we can add in this part, um, but we do want to thank you for joining us for part two of our three-part series. We hope that you will join us for part three. We think we've added just the right amount of information to make this interesting and um, informative so that you can be successful in your doctoral journey. Thank you, and we'll see you in part three.